All right, let's open, let's open our Bibles. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read a passage, and uh, honestly, I'm, uh, after that, uh, I'm going to pretty much get out of the way. But I, I want to give some clarity on where we're at in this series. So we've been talking about, like, why we pray, how we pray. Uh, I talked about a message about an honest prayer. And, and then uh, last, last week, I, I love how Miss Eugene shared about being marked by prayer. She was so fun. Where's, where's Matt? Matt did a great job, too. It was so cool having you guys up there. And, and, and that message marked by prayer, I want you guys to understand, it's, it's the message, of course, is, is about Saul who became Paul. In a moment that he was marked by a person coming and laying their hand on his shoulder and saying such a simple prayer. And it, that moment, it wasn't the prayer that saved him, but, but God used that prayer to release him into the next season of his life. And, and, and I know a lot of you guys raised your hand last week. Of, uh, you had moments that you were marked by prayer. Someone prayed for you in a specific moment or you prayed for someone else in a specific moment. And you're like, gosh, that moment marked me. No, it, no it, that moment didn't save you. And no, you probably don't remember every single word that was said. But, but you're, when you think about encounters with Jesus, your mind goes back to that prayer, that moment. And uh, I, I truly believe that we can live lives that are marked by prayer. Anybody ever uh, drive or, or ride on the freeway and you see these mile markers? You notice that there's, there's not foot markers on the road, but there's mile markers. Because it's not that we, we, we need to know each and every step, but every once in a while we just need a, a reminder where we're at. And God uses prayer to do that oftentimes. And, and we're marked by prayer. And, and tonight we have a cool opportunity to hear from a number of communicators as we march through this beautiful example. So many of you guys may know that this, this series is called Teach Us to Pray. And it was actually, uh, of, that's actually a verse, and we talked about it earlier uh, in, in the month, or last month. There's a verse where the disciples who follow with Jesus, and we said it, uh, he, they didn't ask teach us to do miracles. They didn't ask teach us to preach. They didn't ask teach us how to turn water into wine. I guess they could have, but they didn't. They didn't ask teach us how to walk on water. They said, teach, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Now, the cool thing is when Jesus responded, he said, pray like this. And I'm going to read it out of Matthew. And it says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And in some of the ancient scrolls, it finishes with, and yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we navigate through this prayer tonight, I'm asking you to open your heart. I'm asking you to take notes. And I'm asking you to lean in to every word that's spoken because it's not spoken from people, but the Lord wants to speak to you. All right. Lord, be with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, we're going to jump start. This is Tori. My name is Miranda, if you guys don't remember from last week. Um, we're starting with our Father in Heaven. So we're going to go through different steps of that verse that he just read. So ours is our Father in Heaven. What I love about this verse is that he really clearly states how to pray to God. And you can read it by, one, giving glory to God, two, thanking him for his ultimate sovereignty, um, knowing that the agenda of God is ultimate and that he is a father. Four, God wants us to know the desires of your, far, of your heart <laughs> and forgive others as he forgave you. Ask God to, to deliver us from evil and harm, and then for yours is the kingdom and glory forever. But first and foremost, what does it say? It says, our father in heaven. And what is so special about this is that it is clearly saying that God is not just this lofty God who doesn't want to hear from us. God is a father who loves us and who wants to hear from us. He cares about us. And what, it, what is so wonderful is, is that there's so many verses that state that. And the one I'm going to bring up is 1 John 3, 1. And it says, see how very much our father loves us. For he calls us his children, and that is what we are. And I'm just pr praying, and she's going to pray for you, that you guys just ultimately know that God is your father and that he loves you and he wants to hear from you. He wants to be your protector, your guidance. 
um, the love of your life, and that is just truly what I want you guys to hear from this. Okay. All right, guys, we're going to pray. Well, Father God, we just come before you, Lord, and I just thank you, Jesus, for what you are doing in our lives, Father, the breath that you have given us in our lungs every day and the such specific purpose that you have for us as individuals, Lord. I'm praying for the hurting hearts with fatherly love in their life. Jesus, I'm praying that you would reveal the fatherness, everlasting love that you are, that you are our father first and you have created us in your image so, Lord, I'm just praying that when we come to you before prayer, Lord, that we are seeing our Father who loves us so much more than anything on this earth can offer. So I'm praying that when we come to you, Lord, that we would see your face, we would see your godly spirit, that we would not be seeing the failures of men on this earth but, Lord, that we would recognize who you are and we would be able to experience that in us and share that with others. So, Lord, I'm just praying for a revival, just a change of spirit and heart, God, that you would just heal the broken, God, and that you would just release your spirit in us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, so me and Greg had... Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. So, hallowed be your name. And we have a quote, Bella, if you could, there you go. So this, I wish I could say these words were mine. I'm not that smart, but um, don't look at Ty. Um, he is nodding his head. But I wish I could say these are mine. This is from an article I, I was reading, and I, I just loved it. So I'm going to read it. So, hallowed be your name. It's telling us to worship God and to praise him for who he, who he is. The, the phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is a reminder to us that we are to pray for God's plan in our lives and the world. Not our own plan. We are to pray for God's will to be done, not f for our desires. And for hallowed be your name, um, I just thought of it as uh, bringing glory to God in everything that it is in our lives. That it is through him that we are here. It is through him that we have the blessings that we have. It is through him that we are protected by his blood. And your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Um, it is through his will, again, that we are here. It is through his will that um, certain things happen in our lives. And that reminds me of Job. Um, Job was wealthy. He had a bunch of cattle, and that cattle was the status of how much wealth he had. But and I'm not talking about the wealth he has right now. Um, but if you read later in about Job, um, he has, you see that the devil tries to go to, goes to God, and he asks God, essentially, if he can mess with Job. So even through that, it's through God's will that he allowed Job to go through that. It was just to essentially mess with the devil. I mean, it just tried to psychologically mess with the devil. But it's through God that certain things happen to us, and it's through him that he will use whatever he meant, whatever the enemy meant for evil, he will turn it for good. Yes, but here's Greg. He's going to pray for us. All right, everyone. Would you uh, bow your heads and close your eyes? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Um, I just pray over, over the students, Lord, over the leaders, over everyone in this room, Lord, in this sanctuary, Lord, that your will in their lives is magnified, Lord, that they are able to gain an understanding and wisdom over, their, over your plan for them, Lord and that they are understanding that if they are here that they are here lord that they have a plan that you have a plan for them lord that there is no one a mistake here lord that no one is here by accident there is no coincidence that they are here listening to your word listening to your followers lord that they are here by your will lord and as your will grows in their life lord they get to know and deepen their understanding of who you are lord and who are who you are to us lord as you are our comforter lord you are our our savior lord you are the one who redeems us lord and as we pray lord and when we pray together lord i just pray that we get an understanding of more of who you are daily daily moments by moments lord feeling your presence feeling your plan within us lord feeling your calling towards us lord feeling filling your our call your call to one another lord and i just pray that as we 
keep going and we keep living life with each other, Lord, that we keep encouraging, we keep, we keep discouraging the devil, we keep pushing him away by your name and your holy name, Lord, and we keep up, uh, uprooting what the, the devil has planned for us, Lord, and in your name, Lord, that we are able to set fire to it and we are able to extinguish any fires, any fiery arrows that the devil has thrown at us, Lord, and it's in your plan that we are able protect, to be protected by this, Lord, and I just pray that in your holy son's name. Amen. Hello, I'm Jacob. For you, for you who don't know me, uh, me and Chris, uh, we got Give Us Today Our Daily Bread. And so when we're looking at giving us our daily bread, right, it's to provide physical and spiritual fulfillment. Uh, we need God to provide for us daily. So if we look at Exodus 16.4, then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So every single day, we need to go before God and get our daily fill of his spirit, right? It's not, it's not just uh, about, you know, it's, it's not just about the physical aspects. It's about the spiritual aspects as well. God provides both for all of us, right? All right. So, and just as manna came down from heaven, God also sent Jesus from heaven, right? And that is our eternal manna, right? All right. So in, in John 6, 48... Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. And here we have Jesus who, if you think of bread, right, if, it, if let's say it is touched by a liquid or something, it's saturated, right? Jesus wants to saturate you spiritually, right? He's, he, he came down here to fulfill the will of the Father and to be there for all of us, right? All right. And then in John 6.50, he says, this is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. So not did Jesus just come to sustain us physically, but he came down for all of us to live eternally with him, to be filled with his spirit, right? And so now we go to a time when Jesus is being tempted by the devil, right? And the devil says, if you are the son of God, command these rocks to turn into bread. And Jesus answers, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, <laughs> but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so Jesus is saying, you know, the, the word of God sustains us every day. And it is very imperative for us to be in God's word every day because that also fills us spiritually. All right, and to wrap this up, in Exodus 16.32, Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generation. So this jar of manna represents our testimony about Jesus, right? So this jar of manna is to be passed down from generation to generation, so it is our job to go before others and share our testimony about Jesus because he is the bread of life, because he is the Savior. He is the one above all, all other names. And, and so when we pray, we come before God with, with humble hearts, and we come before him asking to give us his portion of what he has for us every single day. And so now I'm going to pass it off to Chris, and he's going to close us in prayer. All right, let's pray, guys. God, we just thank you for being such a good God. Thank you for always providing for us every, every need, God. I, pray, I thank you that, um, that we never lack, God, when we ask for you. And uh, God, we, we thank you for the ultimate bread of life, God, the, your son, Jesus Christ, that you sent to die on the cross for our sins, God. I pray that, uh, that we don't forget that. Uh, God, I pray that as we go forward uh, from this day on, uh, when we pray, that we don't forget to look back at all the, the times that you've provided for us, God, and all the times that you were there, uh, everything that you've done for us in the past, God, and I pray that we take those, uh, and it just builds our faith, and it, uh, and it uh, lights a fire for our future looking ahead, God, and that, that we won't uh, be worried or scared of the future that, um, of not having enough or feeling like, uh, like we're less than, God. I, I know that you're going to provide for us all in the future. 
uh, you're going to give us the bread of life in the future. Or you've given us the bread of life, God, so we can have eternal life for the future, God. Uh, we love you. We thank you for always being our provider, God, our Jehovah Jireh. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, I'm Natasha, and this is Kyla, and we have, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When we talk about forgiveness, there are a few things to remember. One, if we don't forgive others, forgiveness won't be available to us. It says in Matthew 6, 14 through 15, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. So when it comes to forgiveness, we have to extend the same grace that we're asking the father for. So two, forgiveness is more than just an action. It's a heart posture. It is a direct reflection of the humility that lives inside of us. When we ask for forgiveness, we have to humble ourselves to confess where we went wrong and how we can change. So three is forgiveness should lead to a change of actions. Second Chronicles 714, when if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and restore their land. So here the Lord is saying that he will forgive us when we turn from doing what is wrong to doing what is in his will. So today I asked a few people what the word forgiveness meant to them. And this is what a few people told me. The first thing that came to their mind was forget about it. It's easier with certain people than it is with other people. The Lord speaks of it no more. He totally erases all of it when he forgives us and he's asking the same of us. But do we want the Lord to forgive us and speak of it no more, erase it? Or do we want him to forgive us the way we sometimes forgive people and bring it up in people's faces when we're angry? The other word that was first that came to their mind was hard. It's hard to ask for and hard to give, but it's life. Without part of it, without it, parts of us die. Parts of our trust that we are truly forgiven dies too. And then two people said the same thing, freedom. Without forgiveness, we will never have true freedom. All right, let's go before the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy, God, that uh, your word says is new every single morning. We thank you that we can come before you and ask for forgiveness. And Lord, I... I'm just asking tonight, Jesus, that when we come to you, when we pray, Father, that we not be fooled into thinking that we don't need your forgiveness, that we don't need your mercy, Jesus. Lord, I pray that when we come to you, that we are reminded daily that it is only by you that we can live in freedom. It is only by you that we can live with our sins washed away. And Lord, I pray that when we come to you and we ask for forgiveness, that we are reminded to extend that same grace to others, God, in all things. Lord, you ask us to... Let others live free as well, Lord. And uh, Jesus, I ask that when we come to you and we ask for forgiveness, that that instills a change in our hearts, that we not live the ways we were living before, but that is a reminder to us that we have not called, we have not called to live the way we used to live, but we are called to live free. We are called to be new creations in your name, Jesus. And we pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. All right, what's up, guys? My name's Elisa, and this is Steph, Stephanie. She's actually the person in charge of altar ministry, so I got lucky with this one. Um, so I have, well, we have Matthew 6, 13. It says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, the question is, why do we even face temptation? Well, in 1 John 5, 19, it says, we know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We live in a world that normalizes and encourages sin, and the devil loves that. And he even encourages it. He does his best to encourage it. He does his best to speak it into us. Um, and we will face temptation because even Jesus faced temptation. We see that when he was in the wilderness, and the devil actually spoke to Jesus, and he tried to get, 
he tried his best to get Jesus to turn away from God and to fall into temptation. The devil even used the word of God to try to convince Jesus to fall into temptation. But what did Jesus do? He knew the word of God even better, and he used it to slap the devil in the face. And he used the word of God, and he used it as his, as his strength. He used it as his comfort. And the question is, how can we be delivered from temptation? Just like Jesus, we need to know the word of God for strength. In Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus said this, sorry. Jesus said this to two of his disciples the night before he was arrested to be crucified for all of our sins. And you can only imagine what Jesus was feeling in this moment. He didn't want to die, but he knew he had to. He had to die for all of our sins. And he still prayed to his father. Why did he pray to God? Because he knew that God would give him comfort and strength. We also need to remember this. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So the main thing that I want you guys to walk away with is that God is your strength. He's your comfort. And we serve a God that always provides a way out despite the temptations that we face or fall into. And Steph's going to pray for us. Let's pray. Father, as we pray to you daily, we pray, Lord God, that you would strengthen us to refrain from temptation. And Lord, we speak against the lie and the common thought that temptation is from you and that we are the only ones experiencing that. Lord, your word says that all believers face temptation. Your word also states that you are not a tempter because you are not an evil God. But Lord, you are always provide a way out. So Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' mighty name that we would always see that way out, that we would hear you clearly, and Lord, that we would be obedient and submissive to that, Lord, even if it's difficult, if it's hard, that Lord, you would keep us away from every single temptation that would lead us away from you. Lord, that we would cling to you, that we would turn to you, Lord God, and that we would trust you and we would trust where you're leading us, even if we don't fully understand it. Lord, we pray that you would always teach us to resist evil and completely be safe in the arms of our, of our loving Father. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So my name is Tyrone, and, and this is Renee. So uh, we have... Uh, the, the final line of this prayer, and it says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I love the fact that Jesus concluded his prayer really giving a good example and representation of the posture of his heart towards who God is. There's a lot of things in, in this prayer where Jesus is, is making requests. He's, he's asking, can you provide my needs? Will you protect me from evil? Will you, will you forgive me? You, you, you know, he's, he's giving us examples. This is, this is Jesus really praying in front of his disciples so that they can hear the words, because really this prayer wasn't for Jesus. This was from Jesus, for the disciples to model after, for us to model after. And I love how, though he has different requests, no, he does address the needs. At the very end, what he does is he reminds himself and he reminds those that are listening the position that the Father is in. And the fact that, that no matter what we request, no matter what God can do for us, what matters the most is that the kingdom is his. That, that our life is only a part of his master plan. Are we trusting him with our, our desires? Are we trusting him uh, to guide us? Are we trusting him to protect us? Yes, but his is the kingdom. There's only one throne in this universe and he's sitting on it. And, what, and what, the, what Jesus wants to model is, is the posture and positions of our heart. Yeah, we, we, we have the opportunity to ask for things. We have the opportunity to say what we want to, to the Lord. But at the end of the day and at the end of each prayer and at the end of, of, of each day, we should once again declare from our own mouths, declare from our own hearts, but Lord, the kingdom is yours. And I'm trusting you with whatever you do. God, this is what I'm asking. God, this is what I'm believing for, but I'm trusting you. I love how it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord 
with your whole heart. Lean not on your, on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. By, by trusting in him, we are releasing the things. I, I love the fact that we can say, Lord, your plan is greater than my anxieties. Your plan is greater than my uncertainties in life, greater than my, my plans, greater than my desires, greater than my highs and my lows. And of course, the other reason why we can, we can say at the end of a prayer, Lord, yours is the kingdom, because Jesus said it. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trials. In this world, you will have sorrows, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. That's in John, uh, John chapter, oh my gosh, it's verse 16. What's the, what's the chapter? There we go. Oh, there we go. John 16, 33. John 16, 33, it says that we have to take heart. He's overcome the world. So the cool thing is as Jesus is saying these words in his prayer, it's reminding us that we are not fighting for victory, but we're fighting from a position of victory. Why? Because we're on Jesus' side. Why? Because we put our trust in him. So I truly believe that each and every one of us, as we go through this prayer series and as we apply this to our prayer life, not just in this series but beyond, Make sure that you continuously position your heart, continuously position your mind with an understanding that, Lord, the kingdom is yours. And how he says the glory is his, guess what? Nothing about our life, contrary to what you may be taught and contrary to maybe what some of the things that you see, nothing about our life is for our own glory. When you surrender your life to Jesus, when you make him your Lord and Savior, you are saying, you are saying to him and declaring from your heart, Lord, Everything I do is to give you glory. Everything I do is to reflect glory onto you and unto you. And guess what? When the Lord can trust you to give the glory to him, he in turn gives you more of his grace, more of his favor, more of his blessings because he can entrust to you that you're gonna return it right back to him with your gifts, talents, and abilities. Let's bow our heads. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with humble hearts. We ask for strength when we are weak, love when we feel forsaken. We ask for courage when we are afraid, and for wisdom to know that your plan will forever be greater than any plan we could possibly conceive. Let us always be mindful and grateful that we have eternity with you, and that yours is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.